So welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be discussing Chapter 7, which is Ventilation, Perfusion, and Shock, and overall understanding pathophysiology. Uh, what pathophysiology is, um, we'll have a slide in a little bit, explain it a little, a little bit more for you. Uh, it's the study of how diseases actually affect our body. So we'll get down to even the cellular level of what's going on in the cell and how diseases will affect the cell and how that will, in turn, affect larger systems in our body. Now, there's two ways to learn medicine. Um, one way is to learn every disease out there and what it does or how it affects the body, the signs and symptoms you'll see in a patient, and then the ways that you have to treat them. If you memorize all those aspects of every single disease out there, you'll be fine in medicine. Or if we know the pathophysiology or the study of the disease and how it works on the body and we understand the body as a whole of how it works, then we can throw different diseases at you. You can um, use your knowledge and deduce what's happening um, with the disease and how, what effect it has on the body. And then we'll say, well, if it's doing this to the body, then we can do this to treat it. So understanding pathophysiology is a much easier way of understanding medicine as a whole. Because if you can understand what's happening, then you can understand the signs that you're going to be seeing because you know what's happening inside the body, and you also understand how to treat it. So that's why we teach pathophysiology and why it's such a big topic. A uh, little disclaimer, um, pathophysiology is something you can spend years and years and years studying. We're only doing one day on it. And that's because at the basic EMT level, we just need to grasp the... the highlights of pathophysiology, kind of the basics of how things work. Um, so we aren't going to dive too far into this topic. We're going to try to keep it as surface level as possible. Just understand there is a lot of information out there on pathophysiology. And feel free if you want to study on your own to go deeper into a lot of these principles, but we're just going to be touching the very basics of it. So just keep that in mind that we're keeping this very basic versus what's actually out there. You're not going to be a master of pathophysiology at the end of this. Also, a little disclaimer, this is a broad topic. It's a lot of stuff that's kind of hard to grasp sometimes. And if you miss one step, especially early on, you aren't going to understand the next 10 steps. So if at any point you get confused, feel free to rewind the video and rewatch the slide or reach out to me and ask me a question or anything to help you grasp these concepts because really we need you to master one concept in this topic before we move on to the next one and things will start making a lot more sense once we get into all this so all that being said let's dive in so we're going to be talking about the cell the cardiopulmonary system shock and some pathophysiology of other systems which we're just going to touch on those for just a few minutes per system. So again, pathophysiology is the study of how disease processes affect the function of the body. And understanding this will help you recognize the changes that you might see with a patient um, as they're going through these problems, um, specifically shock. Uh, one of the biggest things is for us to recognize the early symptoms of shock so that we can stop it before it becomes to a point where we can't treat it anymore. So the cell membrane, that's the outside of the, shell, of the cell, it serves a lot of purposes. Um, it first protects the, the cell, and then also will selectively allow substances through there, like electrolytes or water. Uh, it's what is the gate to get into the cell. And so it helps balance out everything that the cell needs. Um, if it has uh, too much water in it, water will be able to go out of the cell membrane to balance it out. If it needs more water, it can come through. Same with some other electrolytes and um, some other things that the cell needs to function properly. One of the structures in the cell you have to um, have a grasp on is called the mitochondria. The mitochondria is responsible for making energy inside the cell. Uh, 
a lot of biology teachers in high school um, like to drill into students saying that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Um, that's a co common saying of um, people who've taken high school biology because uh, this is one of the very um, top, most important structures of the cell that we need to know to understand how cells work. So the mitochondria converts glucose, which we're going to talk about on that length today, and some other nutrients into uh, a thing called ATP. Uh, the long name is adenosine triphosphate. And ATP is, is energy. Um, a good way to look at it is um, inside your body with the cells, ATP is the currency or the money. So in order for the cell to be able to do any function, it needs to spend that currency, the ATP. So it needs to have a lot of it um, that's producing so it can spend it to actually do the function that the cell is meant, that, meant to do. Um, <clears throat> without ATP, most of the cell's specialized structures can't function. So if, say, all of your cardiac cells did not have ATP anymore, then your uh, cardiac cells would not be able to function and your heart would stop. So right here we have a diagram of the cell. Like I said, we're going to try to keep this as basic as possible. So a lot of this is just kind of for your reference. Uh, I'll point out a few of the things that we do need to know. So right around here, that is the cell membrane. So that's the, the area that lets substances in and out of the cell. Then these blue guys right here, these are the mitochondria. So these are what's actually producing the ATP. Then this guy right here, this is the nucleus. Nucleus is um, the kind of brains of the operation. Um, it's where your DNA is housed. It's the uh, center of the cell that controls everything else. So nucleus, your mitochondria, and your cell membrane. Those are the real big ones that we need to remember for what's inside of a cell. So as I mentioned a little bit before, uh, cells need to have a correct balance of water. Uh, both inside and outside. Uh, if we don't have enough water on the inside of a cell, it is going to dehydrate and die relatively quickly. And then if you put too much water in it, it starts drowning itself. So you can't have your basic functions happen within the cell. So the um, cellular membrane really needs to be quite keen to getting that water in and out based off of the needs of the cell. <clears throat> uh, water can also affect the levels of um, electrolytes. And electrolytes are what's pumped in and out of the cell that can give the cell an electrical charge, which most cells need an electrical charge in order to carry out its specialized function. So it wants you to kind of think of the analogy of a oil uh, refinery and how a refinery will turn the crude oil into gasoline for use in automobiles. And that's what we do with cellular respiration. If you remember back to our terminology, um, I said ventilation versus respiration for airway. Ventilation was the actual movement of air in and out of your body, kind of like a air vent in your house. It's moving the air. And then respiration is the actual exchange of gases happening inside your lungs. Uh, same thing can be said with cellular respiration. That's what we call it is when... Um, oxygen is going into the cell being used carbon dioxide is being taken out um, <clears throat> so if you think about cellular respiration so that's the use of uh, materials and you compare it to an oil refinery an oil refinery will take the crude um, oil and combine it with some other parts and then out comes gasoline which is a useful form of energy for us so cell is the same thing. It's going to be taking glucose and oxygen, some electrolytes, combines it all together and gives you ATP um, as a result, which is a useful energy for the cell. So just think of those two different forms of conver converting um, raw material into energy. And that's a good way to remember things. So glucose, I said I was going to talk about this quite a bit. Uh, glucose is sugar. It's what we get out of the food that we eat. It's the basic thing that we need for energy. So uh, once you eat, it gets absorbed into your bloodstream. Then it starts going to every single cell because every cell needs glucose in order to create energy. <clears throat> uh, so when your cell creates ATP, you have to have glucose come in. Then hopefully 
we have oxygen come in to help. We're going to talk about that in the next slide. But another key thing that we need is something called insulin. Insulin is produced by the pancreas. When you have issues producing insulin, that's where you become a diabetic. And we're going to talk about that at length with our endocrine and di diabetic lecture. But insulin is what allows glucose to actually enter the cell. If you think about the cell as a locked room, insulin is the key that will unlock the door and allow glucose to come in. So without insulin, uh, you don't have a means to open that door and get the glucose into the cell. And with too much insulin, which is a problem we see in diabetes sometimes, is all the doors open up at once, all the glucose goes in because all the doors are open, and then suddenly we don't have any glucose left. So that's something we'll discuss with diabetes. But knowing that you need to have a adequate supply of insulin, but also match it to the supply of glucose you have in your body. That's really what we want you to take away from this, is knowing that you have to have insulin and it has to have a good ratio to the amount of glucose you have um, in your body. So I said that we're going to come back to oxygen with uh, glucose. Um, oxygen is what's preferred in order to make ATP. So when you're making ATP, you have to have glucose. But if you combine glucose with oxygen, you end up making ATP a lot faster and a lot more efficiently, and you produce a lot more of it. So when oxygen is present, it's what we call aerobic metabolism or aerobic respiration for the cell. If you think of, if you're doing aerobics at the gym, that's something that makes you breathe faster because um, you're working out your muscles a lot more. So if you think breathing, you get a lot more oxygen, that's aerobic respiration or aerobic metabolism. So that is cellular respiration that uses oxygen. Now you do have a backup system where your cell can make ATP without oxygen, and that's called anaerobic metabolism or respiration. So the AN means without, then aerobic. And whereas we can do that, it's a lot more, less efficient. Uh, you create a fraction of the ATP that you would with oxygen. Uh, usually with oxygen, you actually create about 15 times more ATP than in, if you don't have oxygen present. And also, uh, you produce less energy, but you also produce a lot more waste products uh, when you don't have oxygen present. When you have oxygen present, you create the waste product of carbon dioxide when you uh, make ATP. But when oxygen's not present, you create uh, something called lactic acid. And so you um, have a good amount of that waste, which is pure acid, going back into your body. Lactic acid is um, actually something that you can feel if you um, ever feel sore after a really big workout um, and you like move your muscle and it really hurts to move and um, the soreness is all over. That's actually from the build of lactic acid because when you work out, uh, your muscles go into an anaerobic um, respiratory respiration phase because you don't have enough oxygen to provide to all the cells that are demanding that at the time. So you do produce lactic acid. It then sits in that area and that's the soreness you feel is the movement of lactic acid. So the issue with lactic acid is it will go back into your body and then it makes your blood more acidic. Um, problem with your blood being acidic is it starts to affect your um, body systems. Uh, one of the biggest ones that can affect is your breathing. If you have acid in your blood, then oxygen can't bind to your red blood cells as easily. So the problem with this is if you are already in an oxygen deprived state because you're in anaerobic um, respiration, you start to produce the acid, which um, lowers your body's pH, makes it acidic, and that in turn makes it harder for oxygen to bind to your red blood cells, so you continue more anaerobic respiration, which then creates more acid, which then makes it harder for oxygen to attach, which then in turn makes more acid, <laughs> and so it's a vicious cycle that uh, just keeps on getting worse and worse and worse and worse and starts cascading down, and that is the basics, basis of shock. Um, we're going to get into that quite a bit, but that's why shock is something that we need to correct.
because if we get into that cycle, it's just going to keep on um, going down and down and down and down until it can eventually kill you. So we do need to intervene when we see um, signs of anaerobic metabolism or the starts of hypoperfusion. So right here is a visual diagram of what we were just talking about with uh, aerobic metabolism and anaerobic metabolism. So if you see, uh, you have glucose coming in and hitting your mitochondria, and you have no oxygen present right here. So oxygen is not coming in through here. So you have a small amount of ATP coming out, but then you also have pyruvic acid, which turns into your lactic acid coming out. So this is anaerobic versus when you have oxygen coming in, you just have a simple glucose goes in, oxygen goes in, a large amount of ATP goes out, and then um, carbon dioxide comes out as your waste product, which is a lot easier for us to get rid of because we just breathe that out pretty quickly. So as we talked about earlier, uh, the cell membrane is the guardian of the cell. It's what allows things in and out of the cell. So a lot of disease processes, um, they target your cell membrane. Um, so their goal is to alter the permeability of the membrane to allow other things in. Uh, and so if that happens and the cell membrane is allowing substances that shouldn't be there, uh, you then have um, interference with the regulation of water, which in turn will uh, disrupt the function of the cell and most likely kill it pretty quickly. So that's how diseases go after our body is it wants to um, alter our cell membrane to allow too much or too little something in and then it's going to kill the cell if you have a disease process that does that to a lot of cells in a specific area that's how you end up um, having death of some organs so some disease processes will attack all the cells in the liver and if all the cells in the liver um, start losing their permeability and start dying off that's where you end up having liver failure, which is fatal if you don't get um, treatment. So that's how a lot of our diseases work. And that's why it's important for us to know this stuff. Right here is a quick video that um, covered the um, structure of the cell. So reminder, the respiratory and cardiovascular systems work together hand in hand. Respiratory system brings the oxygen into the body and removes the waste products, so the carbon dioxide. And then the um, cardiac system will distribute the oxygen to all the cells. So if you have a failure in one area, then it's going to be a failure of the entire system. Remember, we have that uh, chain link of uh, survival. And if one of those links goes wrong, then you don't have your um, chain anymore. All right, so some review of the airway anatomy. Up here, we have our larynx, those are your vocal cords. So right here is your um, glottis, your glottal opening. I did forget to mention anatomy and physiology. We have what's called the lower airway and the upper airway. And the upper airway, that's everything before your glottis right here. So that's everything before it's um, your esophagus and glottis split off. So your nose, your mouth, your pharynx, which is the areas behind there, that's all upper airway. And then as soon as you pass through your glottis, through your upper glottis, uh, you're going to be into your lower airway. So right here is all of the lower airway. Okay. So air enters, passes the larynx, that's where the vocal cords are, then it enters the trachea, so that's your common passageway right here. Then it goes into your left side and your right side. These are called your left and right main bronchus. You can see the label right here. So it's your left main bronchus and your right main bronchus. From that, it has to get much, much smaller. So we go into our areas of secondary bronchus. You can see the label right there. That's a secondary bronchus. Then it gets even smaller, like this guy. And that's a tertiary bronchus, as you can see right here. 
and then it gets even smaller into these little little branches. And these are called bronchioles. So bronchiole is the smallest um, that a bronchus will get. If you remember, um, our term terminology is pretty much the same with uh, your cardiovascular system. You go from artery to arteriole to your capillary. So if you and then coming back, you have your vein and your venule is a smaller version of the vein. So if you remember um, the ole at the end, that means small. So bronchiole is the smallest that you're going to get. And then at the end of the bronchioles, you have what are your called your alveoli, which we'll cover in uh, the next picture. So here's the end of the bronchiole. So you can see right here it's labeled, this is a bronchiole. And all these little circly things, that's your alveoli. Your alveoli, here's a closer picture right here, they're covered everywhere in capillaries. So the blood that's being pumped from the heart will um, surround all these alveoli, and it's a very, very thin membrane to where uh, you can have the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide going between. So this is where the actual gas exchange happens, is in your alveoli, um, which you can see the nickname is air sacs, and that's at the end of your bronchioles. So this is where all the action actually happens, is right here, okay? <clears throat> so in order for us to actually be able to breathe, uh, you have to have an open airway. The term that we use for that is called patent, P-A-T-E-N-T. Um, so the airway has to be patent for the system to function. Uh, if you have a, an obstruction anywhere, that means that your airway is not patent. And obstructions are common. Uh, your tongue is a very common source of uh, an obstruction. If you go unconscious, your tongue can fall into the back of your airway, and air cannot get past your tongue. And we're going to talk about that a lot in airway management because that's something that um, us as EMTs can remedy. Uh, other upper airway obstructions uh, can be a foreign body, so food and choking on food or choking on some other foreign body, which is very common in kids. Another one is infection. So uh, if you have um, kids, a lot of times get croup, which we'll talk about a lot with uh, pediatrics. And that's an infection in your upper airway that will cause inflammation. And if the area is inflamed, then it's really hard to get air through because it's a much smaller opening. And then another um, obstruction you have is trauma. If you're stabbed or shot or something comes through and destroys a tissue in your airway, then you can't pass gas through that tissue anymore because the tissue is not existent. All right, so going more specifically into the lungs. Um, as I said, we have the upper airway and lower airway. The lungs are part of your lower airway. And we have a few terms that you do have to know. Uh, first one is tidal volume, and that is the volume of air that is moved in and out of your body during each breath. So one breath will move um, X amount of tidal volume. Typically for men and an adult male, your tidal volume is about 500 milliliters. For an adult female, it's typically about 400 milliliters. So that's the amount of air that actually gets moved in and out. And one little thing to remember about tidal volume is you have, um, you have a lot of space between your mouth, the nose where air comes in, and your alveoli. You have a lot of ground to cover right there. So not all the air that you breathe in is actually going to reach your alveoli for gas exchange. So uh, the space between your alveoli and your mouth or nose, wherever you're taking in air, is called your dead space. And because it's dead space because that's space that is not doing any gas exchange. And that's about 150 milliliters of your tidal volume that ends up being dead space. So of that 500 milliliters, of tidal volume in an adult male, uh, you have to subtract 150, so that would be 350. That's the amount of air that's actually doing some gas exchange. So just keep that in mind when we're talking about tidal volume. Another thing with tidal volume that it's not in this uh, these slides, but it is in your textbook, is uh, the air that we breathe from the environment it is not entirely oxygen. In fact, it's mostly nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen takes up about 70% of what's in the air. Uh, the amount of oxygen in the air is only about 21%. And that is a number you guys have to know forwards and, sorry about that, uh, forwards and backwards 
is 21%. That is the amount of oxygen that you will breathe from atmospheric air. So keep in mind that in that tidal volume, um, you already have to subtract three, um, 150 milliliters for your dead space. And then you also have to keep in mind that only 21% of that re remaining 350 milliliters is actual oxygen that your um, body can take and use. And we'll talk about that a lot more when we talk about airway management and oxygen administration, because if someone is oxygen deprived, we can then give them supplemental oxygen and raise the percentage of oxygen in their tidal volume. Because if we're um, shoving pure oxygen in your face and that's all you're breathing is pure oxygen, all of a sudden, instead of 21% of what's in your alveoli can be used, now 90% or 100% of what's in your alveoli can be used um, to attach to your red blood cells. So those are a few things about tidal volume itself. But remember the term tidal volume, that is the amount of air moving in and out during each breath cycle. Know that there is dead space, about 150 milliliters, and know that there's 21% of oxygen in atmospheric air. All right. So a lot of terms right there. Um, and now I'm going to throw another term at you. It's called minute volume. Because minute volume is the measuring stick that we use to make sure that someone is breathing enough and they're breathing adequately. So minute volume, you have to take your tidal volume. So that's the amount of air in one breath. Then you multiply it by your respiratory rate. So it should make sense because minute volume measures the amount of air that goes in and out of your body in one minute. So tidal volume is how much you take in one breath, and respiratory rate is how many breaths you take in one minute. So if your tidal volume as an adult male is 500, and your respiratory rate is 12 per minute, you multiply that 500 by 12, and you should get 6,000. And so 6,000 milliliters, or 6 liters, is the minute volume uh, that you're breathing as a healthy adult male if your respiratory rate is um, 12. Your respiratory rate could be 16 at rest, it could be 20 at rest. Most people hang around 12 to 14. Um, we'll talk about that all at, at length when we talk about airway and uh, vital signs and all that. <clears throat> so that's how you calculate minute volume. And minute volume, like I said, is kind of the measuring stick we use to make sure someone is breathing adequately. And there can be changes, and that's what we're about to discuss. So any change in your tidal volume or respiratory rate can reduce or increase minute volume, depending on what type of changes you're talking about. And so respiratory dysfunction. Remember, dysfunction is the struggle of function. Dis is the prefix for um, difficulty and function, so difficulty functioning properly. So respiratory dysfunction occurs any time that something interferes with your minute volume, whether that is a change in your tidal volume or your respiratory rate. So we're going to take a look at some of the causes of this right now. <clears throat> so the first area we're going to look at for respiratory dysfunction is disturbing your respiratory control. And to do that, we have to think about where our respiratory rate is controlled. That's controlled in the brain in an area called your medulla oblongata. Uh, we don't have to really worry about um, much of like where that is in terms of anatomy, but know that it, it is in that section of your brain. It's called your medulla oblongata. And anything that affects your medulla oblongata can affect the rate at which you breathe. And so if you affect the rate that you breathe, you affect your minute volume. Um, some things that can impact the function of the medulla oblongata is infection. Uh, infection, if it changes how your brain is acting, um, that can uh, affect your medulla oblongata. Big one is drugs. Uh, for example, heroin. Heroin uh, will go into your medulla oblongata and um, tell it to, that you don't need to breathe as much, so it lowers your respiratory rate quite a bit. Um, same with drugs. Toxins um, act very similarly. They'll um, confuse your brain into thinking that you don't need to breathe anymore. Uh, trauma is another kind of obvious one. If you have some sort of brain trauma, which could um, result in swelling or even um, the destruction of brain tissue. Uh, if, if you have any sort of traumatic event that causes um, pressure on your medulla oblongata, it can change the amount uh, that your brain is telling you to breathe. And also another big one that's not listed here is like a stroke. 
it, in a stroke, uh, you have disruption of blood flow to your brain somewhere. And if you don't have adequate blood flow to your medulla oblongata, it's not going to function properly. So uh, we'll a lot of times see people with uh, really bad strokes have um, some respiratory issues because they can't control their rate of breathing because their medulla oblongata is um, not functioning properly. The next area that we are concerned about is um, disturbing your pressure. So if you remember back into anatomy and physiology of how the lungs actually operate, uh, your chest is, uh, it's a good way to describe it is think of a vault that's sealed. Uh, and it's meant to be sealed because if you remember your diaphragm goes down when you need to inhale and when it goes down it expands the area that your lungs are in and if that's a sealed vault we then have negative pressure in your lungs uh, which will then draw air in from the atmosphere because it wants to fill in that area of negative pressure to equalize it same when you exhale your diaphragm goes up pushes on your lungs creates positive pressure inside your lungs which then expels air out because your um, air does not want to be in an area of high pressure. So it's going to go back out to the atmosphere. So um, we can't have disruptions to that sealed vault because if you have disruptions to the sealed vault, then you can't create the um, proper amount of negative pressure needed to take an inhalation. So if you compromise the wall somehow, um, a few ways are uh, puncture wounds. So if you're like stabbed in your chest wall or shot, another one is rib fractures. If one of your ribs break and it goes into your chest wall, that will affect the seal of the vault. So you are going to have a, a lot harder time actually getting that um, negative pressure to the point that is needed for air to come in. Um, and that will disturb your respiratory function. Another a uh, way that we can um, disturb the pressure is uh, having blood or air accumulate in your thorax. So your lungs are very, very, very close to your ribs. There's a few millimeter space so that they aren't attached to your ribs. And that space, which is pretty, it has a lot of lubrication, so things should flow very easily um, around them. Um, but that space is called your pleural pleural space, excuse me. And uh, that pleural space is what we need for normal function, but sometimes um, things can disrupt that pleural space if you have, especially with traumas, um, or if you have a tear in your lung itself, um, air can go out of your lung and into that pleural space and stay in that pleural space. If you have trauma, um, you can have blood come into that pleural, pleural space that stays in that pleural space. And the problem behind that is if it takes up too much space in, in that um, sealed vault that we have, then all of a sudden when uh, the diaphragm goes down, you don't have an area for your lung to expand anymore because it's that area that's supposed to expand is taken up by air that's in that pleural space or blood that's in that pleural space. So having either one of those uh, can compromise your respiratory function because you can't get lung expansion anymore, which disrupts your pressure. And we're going to talk about um, those events a lot more in trauma, like a lot more <laughs> in trauma, because those are some life-threatening airway uh, problems that we see a lot in trauma patients. So come back, stay tuned <laughs> for, for talking about that a lot more. Um, the events that we just described, if it's air, it's called a pneumothorax. And if there's blood, it's called a hemothorax, and we're gonna be talking about that quite a bit during trauma. Another uh, way we can have respiratory dysfunction is disruption of the lung tissue itself. And disruption of lung tissue can be caused by one of two things. It can be a trauma problem or a medical problem. So trauma problems are pretty easy, uh, if you think about it. If say you're, you're stabbed in your chest and the knife goes through some of your lung tissue you aren't going to be able to pass gas through that tissue that got destroyed with the knife so that's pretty easy to think about and figure out uh medical problems which is much 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 more common for us to see in the field uh, that's your basic respiratory diseases like asthma asthma will 
inflame the bronchioles, the um, muscle inside of the bronchioles. So it takes a nice wide opening that should be there. And when that muscle swells, it's going to um, constrict and make that opening a lot smaller. And we still need to get the same amount of air through that opening, but we can't because there's just not enough space to actually push it through. So that's a two-fold problem because we can't push oxygen through that tiny space. And we also can't get carbon dioxide out of that tiny space. So carbon dioxide ends up getting trapped in your body because it can't actually get out of uh, your bronchioles because it's inflamed too much. So that results in two problems. Uh, first one is uh, low oxygen levels or hypoxia because oxygen can't get in. And then the second one is high carbon dioxide levels, which the medical term is hypercapnia because carbon dioxide can't get out. So instead of being exchanged in your alveoli, um, you have so much carbon dioxide in there that the carbon dioxide in your blood just wants to stay in the blood because it doesn't want to go to an area where you have a bunch of carbon dioxide already. And so that can result in us getting acidic um, because carbon dioxide is an acid. And then it can result in us going into shock because we have acid circulating in our body. And then we go into that domino effect that we talked about earlier. So when you have respiratory dysfunction, um, your body attempts to compensate for it. Um, and there's two, two ways that your body can sense that you're having respiratory dysfunction. Because most of the time your body doesn't know, oh, I got stabbed in the chest. It just knows I'm not getting air passing through here anymore. Or it doesn't know, oh, I'm having an asthma attack. It just knows I'm not getting air um, through, through here. And the way that your body knows that is uh, your chemoreceptors. So chemoreceptors are in the brain and they detect your changing oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. Mainly they detect your carbon dioxide levels. So if it, um, in a normal functioning human, uh, your chemoreceptors is actually the stimulus that makes you breathe okay? because your, uh, the receptors in your brain will measure the amount of carbon dioxide that's in your blood. If it gets too high, it's going to say, take a breath. If it gets too low, because it does like a little bit in your blood, if it gets too low, it's going to say, okay, we don't need to breathe right now. Um, so that's what controls your actual rate of breathing in your medulla oblongata is your chemoreceptors. Uh, the reason why it detects carbon dioxide levels instead of oxygen levels is carbon dioxide levels change much faster. Uh, if you stop breathing, your um, oxygen levels will maintain pretty high for a few minutes. Uh, usually about five to seven minutes is where you start really dropping off on your oxygen levels because your body has your um, backup systems of not using all your oxygen at once in case if for some reason you can't breathe for a while. That's why you can hold your breath underwater because your body has enough oxygen supply to burn through um, we're going to do it for a while before you need to take a breath. But carbon dioxide, on the other hand, changes very, very quickly. If you take a, f a few breaths really fast, so if you <laughs> really, really fast for 10, 15 seconds, you're going to start getting lightheaded very fast. And that's because you breathe a lot of your carbon dioxide out and your brain is recognizing, oh, I have low levels of carbon dioxide already because you already breathed most of that out and so it's going to make you really lightheaded and dizzy and make you stop breathing really fast and if you continue to breathe really fast it's actually going to make you pass out so that you stop consciously breathing that fast um, and that's because your carbon dioxide levels change so quickly and brain can pick up on it a lot quicker than it can pick up on you having low oxygen levels so that's why um, our chemoreceptors main source to make you breathe is carbon dioxide and we have a backup of low oxygen so if you don't have um, enough oxygen in you you will be stimulated to breathe but that is your backup system in case if your carbon dioxide system stops working which we'll talk about a little bit in respiratory emergencies so all that being said um, if we have respiratory dysfunction your body is going to attempt to compensate for that and one of the main ways that it compensates for uh, respiratory dysfunction is making your 
uh, respiratory rate higher because the goal is to make your minute volume go up and if you can't change your tidal volume then you're going to need to change your respiratory rate and so your brain can sometimes say okay we need to get deeper breath right now uh, that's why sometimes we have to sigh and um, yawn and whatnot because we have to take a deeper breath but most of the time when you have respiratory dysfunction you're taking as deep of a breath as you can so the only variable that we can change is changing your respiratory rate so if for some reason your tidal volume is low because you have some sort of respiratory dysfunction problem so say it's asthma and the air can't get uh, in and out of the lungs so instead of a 500 milliliter tidal volume you now have a 100 milliliter tidal volume because that's all you can push through those constricted openings if you um, so our normal minute volume is 6,000, but now we took our respiratory rate of 12 and now our tidal volume is 100. So we went from a minute volume of 6,000 to 1,200 because that's 12 times 100. Uh, your brain is going to jack it up and say, we'll put our respiratory rate instead of 12, we'll make it 30. And so you now have 100 times 30 and it's going to bring your minute volume up to 3,000 which that's still really low um, and uh, it's, it's half of what you really should be at, but it's three times what we had originally. And that's why uh, even though your body has these um, compensation mechanisms to help you out, uh, we still need to intervene in there because uh, the body can't get the minute volume to the place where it needs to be. Uh, on its own, what, which is why we need to do things like give medications to open the bronchioles up, which will then increase the tidal volume and bring you back to normal. And we'll talk, we're going to talk about that at length during respiratory emergencies. That's just one example of your body compensating for, for you, though. All right, so moving on into the blood. Uh, if you remember from anatomy and physiology, our blood is consisting of four parts. You have plasma, which is the majority of the amount of, or majority of what's in your blood. Then you have your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and platelets. Now, your plasma, if you think of you need to transport your blood, plasma is your train. Um, that's what all the other cells kind of hop on, and um, you can go through the body on. So if you think of the train and your red blood cell hops on the in the cab of the train, the train will then bring you all the way around your body. Um, the red blood cell will hop off wherever it needs to be. And that's why plasma is the majority of what's in the blood. Uh, plasma accounts for about 54% of our blood volume. Um, red blood cells can, are responsible for about 45% of our blood volume. And then our white blood cells and platelets combined only um, account for about 1% of our blood volume. So we're very heavy in plasma and red blood cells, and then our white blood cells and platelets are a very small amount of what's actually in the blood. So going back to red blood cells, red blood cells um, have these receptors on all covering all over them. They're called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin acts like a magnet for oxygen. So when uh, your blood, red blood cells go through your alveoli um, in, in your lungs, you have the magnet and it senses oxygen that's on the other side of the wall, the alveoli, and it's going to um, bring that uh, to your red blood cell and then make it stick there until it's brought to a cell that needs it. So that's the magnet that brings your um, oxygen in and holds it to your red blood cell until it needs to go to a, a normal cell to uh, be processed for ATP. So do know that that red blood cells are what's responsible for carrying your um, oxygen and they do that by using hemoglobin which are part of the red blood cell. All right so now we're going to get into a little bit of advanced stuff so don't feel bad if you need to review this slide several times because this is this is stuff I can spend hours talking about just this little area. It's a lot of stuff to kind of take in at once. So in your blood um, you have proteins that are circulating around. And proteins are magnets for water. And the water in your body is separated into a different amounts in different places. Uh, so six, about 60% of the total body weight of a human is water. 
of that 60%, 70% of the water in your body is found inside of your cells. 25% of it is found in what's called your interstitial space. That's kind of no man's land. It's outside the cells, but not in your organs and not in your blood vessels. And 5% of it is found in your blood vessels. So you got 70% in your cells, 25% in your interstitial space or free space, and 5% in your blood vessels. So as uh, your blood is circulating around, you have these proteins, your proteins are acting as magnets to draw water both out of cells and out of your interstitial space and bring it into your vasculature. The problem with doing that is you don't want to draw too much blood out of the cells or out of your interstitial space because then you cause massive dehydration, your cells will start dying. So whereas we want to have a draw of water into our blood vessels, we can't have too much. So we need something to counteract the draw that proteins place on you. Um, so the draw that proteins place on you is called plasma oncotic pressure. That's the pressure working to bring water towards you. And our counterforce is what's called hydrostatic pressure. And that is the pressure that's constantly in your blood vessels that will push your water back out because water doesn't want to be in a high pressure environment. It wants to sit in as low pressure as possible. So you have the magnet of the proteins bringing water in, but then you have the pressure inside the vessel that wants to push the water back out. So that's where we maintain our balance is we have a balance of attraction and a balance of pushing away. So your plasma oncotic pressure and your hydrostatic pressure work in opposite directions to maintain your homeostasis, the spot that you want to be in. The reason why we need to know this stuff is a change in either one of these will cause a change in your fluid balance. So if you don't have proteins in your blood vessels, uh, say you uh, have liver failure, uh, which your liver produces a protein called albumin, which is one of your most prevalent proteins and it's one of the most attractive ones to water. So if you have liver failure and your liver is not producing the protein albumin anymore, and you don't have that circulating in your blood, you don't have a strong magnet pulling the water uh, into your blood vessels anymore. So that water tends to sit outside of the blood vessels and um, most of it sits into your interstitial space. That's why if you've ever seen a liver failure patient, they have huge stomachs that are, look very like uncomfortably big because it's all water buildup in, your, in their abdomen because the water is sitting in their interstitial space because there's no attraction for it to go into your blood vessels. That will result in um, some low blood pressure because you don't have the water in your blood vessels um, and it starts to um, cause all these other different issues, which is why liver failure is fatal if you don't get it treated because we then lose our um, water balance inside of our blood vessels. On the other side, um, if your blood pressure goes down for any reason, uh, which we'll be discussing that at length. But if it goes down, then suddenly you have these proteins that are in your bloodstream that's attracting the blood, but you don't have the pressure fighting it to push the water back out. So water is then attracted into the blood vessels and it stays there because it's a lower pressure environment. And that's actually one of the ways that your body can compensate for having low blood pressure is um, having the water drawn in and it will bring your pressure up because it fills your blood vessel more. And if you have more fluid in the blood vessel, you're going to have more pressure in the blood vessel. So it's going to fill your vessel up until you get to the pressure that you wanted and things balance back out again. So that's kind of your body's give and take to maintain your blood pressure. So like I said, a lot of stuff in this one slide and it's super deep and I can get much, much, much deeper. Uh, this one slide is an entire class in paramedic school. So review this and go over it again and again and again. Feel free to ask me questions about it. But this is something that we do need to know because that's how we understand our body's basic way that it compensates for blood pressure changes. So blood dysfunction, just like respiratory dysfunction. So without enough blood, uh, your oxygen and carbon dioxide can't be properly moved around because it can't attach to your red blood cells. So if we have a loss of blood anywhere, we have blood dysfunction. Uh, some 
areas that we can have blood um, problems is bleeding. If it's going outside of your body and not staying in your blood vessels, then you're going to have a um, issue with delivering blood. Dehydration. Dehydration will cause a lack of water in your blood vessels. And if you don't have water, um, then you can't have uh, the train that you get on. And so you can't move the red blood cells around well enough because you don't have enough oomph to move it around your body. Anemia. Anemia is the lack of production of red blood cells. So you just aren't producing enough. And then liver failure. Uh, if you go through liver failure, your liver is responsible for removing a lot of the toxins from your body. And so if you can't remove the toxins because your liver's failing, then they stay inside of your body and they start to kill off your red blood cells. So if you don't have the red blood cells, you can't carry the oxygen anymore and um, you end up having blood dysfunction. All right. Uh, so just reviewing our blood vessels again, this should be... Uh, Review from anatomy and physiology. Over here we have our artery and notice how it has a very thick wall right there. That's a wall of muscle because you have much higher pressure. So blood goes down from the artery, goes into your arterioles, which are the smaller arteries, comes into your capillaries. That's where our um, diffusion and gas exchange actually takes place. Dumps into your venules to return to the heart. Venules get bigger and go into your vein. Again, not much muscle here because it's a lower pressure area because we are to squeeze through all these capillaries. And vein returns to the heart. Also notice vein has your one-way valves in them because you, again, have low pressure and oftentimes you're fighting gravity. That's just a quick review of your blood vessels. So your blood vessels exist to take oxygenated blood from the lungs uh, via the heart to all your capillaries. Uh, gas exchange takes place in capillaries, as we talked about, and then blood returns to the lungs via the heart for your gas exchange to get rid of your waste products. Your blood vessels need adequate pressure to make everything work. Um, if you don't have pressure, things can't flow. Um, and so uh, if you have a drop in blood pressure, we have a serious issue because we can't be moving our blood as effectively. Uh, your pressure is controlled by changing the size of the diameter of your blood vessels. Okay, so if your blood pressure goes low, um, say it's the blood can only fill half of the diameter of the blood vessels, your pressure will um, your blood pressure will go up by you constricting those blood vessels because if you constrict those blood vessels, make the opening smaller, it's going to fill the area of the blood vessel, which then puts pressure back on the blood vessel and then we can start moving things again. So your body will continuously um, dilate and constrict your blood vessels to um, depending on what you need to happen with your blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is too high, it's going to dilate or open up your blood vessels a little bit more so that there's not, not so much pressure pushing on your blood vessels. But if it's low, it will constrict and make the opening smaller, which then in turn puts more pressure on the walls. Okay, so one of the very dangerous things that can happen is you have a loss of the muscle tone in your blood vessels, so it loses the ability to constrict and dilate. Usually that means that it's going to, to open up, it's gonna dilate because you can't constrict it anymore, which causes a drop in your blood pressure. Some of the common causes of this is trauma. Uh, trauma, especially to the spine. Um, if your spine is injured and you can't get the signals from your nervous system to the smooth muscle anymore, it's going to not know what to do. So it's going to relax and dilate, which will cause a huge drop in your blood pressure. So trauma is one of them. Infection is another one. Um, if there's a um, infection that either blocks your nerve signals or an infection that makes your muscles not work properly. Either one of those can cause the um, blood vessels to lose their tone. And then another huge one that we see is an allergic reaction. Allergic reaction, um, you lose the ability to um, constrict uh, because your body uh, is trying to compensate for the allergen in there and trying to fight it off with your immune system. And part of that, um, fighting off is uh, dilating your blood vessels. This is going to be covered a lot more in 
um, our allergic reaction talk, which is why I'm trying not to get too, too deep in it today. Um, so we will discuss that much more in depth um, at a later date. So as you can see here, it's just a depiction of a normal blood vessel. You see all the blood is filled, and so it's pushing out on all that all the walls around here. So that's a good pressure that we have. But here we have a dilated vessel, so same blood vessel, blood vessel, just bigger opening. And so now it's only half filled, and we don't have pressure pushing on on all sides. And if there's not pressure pushing on all sides, when we have force coming from the heart, it's just going to be kind of a wave coming through instead of being able to push everything through. Whereas here, if you have pressure coming from this side in, it's going to push everything very quickly out. So that's why blood pressure really matters in actually transporting your blood. If you don't have good blood pressure, you can't transport your blood, so you aren't going to be able to perfuse your cells, so you get low perfusion or hypoperfusion, which is shock. So another... A huge area that we can have blood vessel dysfunction is excessive permeability. So permeability is the ability to um, have fluids move in and out. So if we have excessive, that is a lot of ability to move um, fluids in and out. So when that happens, capillaries are going to leak fluid out of their walls, and the fluids are just going to stay in your in your interstitial space. Uh, the most common way that this happens is severe infection, which severe infection we call sepsis. That's something that we're going to talk about a lot more in just a little bit. So sepsis can cause excessive permeability and will push fluid out of the blood vessels, um, and they'll oftentimes stay in your interstitial space. So right here is just a... Uh, diagram of a permeable capillary. You see, you see all the fluid coming out right here. So fluid will go out and it's going to stay in this space right here, which can cause swelling, which is why when you have an infection, you're going to have areas of swelling. And if you remember back to our lymphatic system, our lymphatic system is the sewage uh, area or sewage department of the body. Its job is to remove excess fluid. And so when you have an infection, you'll have oftentimes swollen lymph nodes because your lymphatic system sees all this fluid that is coming out of your capillaries. It captures it, and then it stores it in the lymph nodes until it can get rid of it. So the lymph nodes get a bunch of fluid in them, so they get swollen. That's something that you can actually palpate in your neck, which again, we talked about with anatomy and physiology. So we talked about um, low blood pressure, which is hypotension. Now we're going to just touch on hypertension. This is not the only time you're going to see this in class. So hyper means um, high, and tension is blood pressure. So that's high blood pressure is hypertension. <clears throat> uh, some things you need to think about is your systemic vascular resistance. That's the amount of resistance that your blood vessels put on your heart. Um, and that's caused by the pressure that's actually inside of your blood vessels. So you can have a lot of different conditions lead to um, having your blood vessels be abnormally constricted. Um, and most of the time, uh, when we're talking about hypertension, we're talking about long-term chronic problems. Um, these are problems that develop after a long period of having your uh, blood vessels constricted and having your pressure being high. Um, and so over time, high blood pressure will cause a lot of different um, major health problems, such as stroke or heart disease. Uh, for example, um, for stroke, one of the things that we um, are worried about with high blood pressure is if you have a blood vessel that the muscle um, inside of it um, is constricted all the time, it has so much pressure being pushed on it from inside the blood vessel, over time, that muscle is going to weaken and weaken and weaken because it just can't handle that amount of pressure pushing against it. And it can get to a point where it gets so weak that it can't hold that pressure anymore. And so it will burst open because it's just overcome by the pressure. If that happens in your brain, that is what we call hemorrhagic stroke because the blood vessel just bursts open in your brain, which is a twofold problem. First, if your blood vessels burst open and bleeding, you can't push blood through it and get to the other areas of your brain. And secondly, you will be bleeding 
freely inside of your brain, which is another sealed cavity. So if you put blood in it, it's going to put pressure on your brain. So that is a very, very, very serious type of stroke, which we'll talk about that at length in neurology. Uh, you don't have to worry about learning that right now. But that's one reason why long-term hypertension is very dangerous for our patients. All right, so moving on into the heart. Um, the heart, uh, if you remember tidal volume um, with breathing, heart, you have stroke volume. So stroke volume is the amount of blood that is uh, ejected from the heart with each contraction. For a normal, healthy adult, about 70 milliliters of blood comes out per each contraction. So that is your stroke volume. Stroke volume is about 70 milliliters of blood. So stroke volume can change, and some factors that change your stroke volume are preload. So that's the amount of blood that's actually coming into your heart. If you don't have blood returning to your heart, you can't fill your ventricles and your ventricles can't fire enough blood out. If you only have 20 milliliters of blood coming in, you can only put 20 milliliters of blood out. So preload will affect your stroke volume. Uh, another one is contractility. And that's how hard your heart actually squeezes. If you, if your heart only squeezes one half of the strength it should, it's only going to push out half the amount of blood that it should. So it takes that 70 milliliters and only pushes out 35 milliliters. Another thing that affects it is afterload, and that's um, the pressure that the heart has to pump against to force blood out into your system. So if you have high blood pressure, um, that's a lot more pressure that you're heart has to work against to push the blood into your body. So if um, high blood pressure increases afterload, which means that you can have less blood that you actually push out because it's harder for your heart to actually move that blood into your body. So those three things can affect your stroke volume. So stroke volume plus or times your beats per minute equals your cardiac output. So just think about your respiratory. Again, tidal volume times respiratory rate is your minute volume. Same concepts here. Your stroke volume, so that's the amount of blood moved in one beat, times your beat per minute is your cardiac output. And cardiac output is measured in how much blood you move per minute. So say your stroke volume is 70 and your beats per minute is 100, that'd be 70 times 100, that'd be 7,000 milliliters. or seven liters, and that is your cardiac output. So that is what's actually um, within the normal range. It's the higher limit of your normal range, but that is the amount of blood that your body should be putting out every minute around, around there. Usually it's around 6,000 to 7,000 milliliters per minute. So if you change your heart rate, or if you change your stroke volume, you're going to be changing your cardiac output. So if your heart rate slows down, or if your stroke volume is reduced, then you're gonna have lower cardiac output. Um, if you increase your heart rate or you increase your stroke volume, which increasing your stroke volume is kind of hard to do, um, your uh, ventricles can only hold so much blood in them, um, then you can increase your cardiac output. Um, some issue, so since we can't increase stroke volume too much, uh, you, your body generally will only increase your heart rate to increase your cardiac output. That works fine up to a certain level. At a certain um, level, your heart can't um, put in enough preload. It doesn't have time to fill up um, before you contract again. So you don't get enough blood coming in. You change your preload, you're going to change your stroke volume because if your preload goes down, your stroke volume goes down. And so at a certain point, you cap out the amount of blood that your heart can actually push out because then your stroke volume starts to go down, which means your cardiac output starts to go down. Even if you keep on raising your heart rate, you're going to start going down in your cardiac output. So increasing the heart rate is good. It's a good way to compensate, but it's not the end all be all because at a certain point, you're going to stop having it be good and it's going to start actually working against you. So some things that can cause heart dysfunction. Uh, first are mechanical problems. 
Um, one that we can see is physical trauma. If you are shot in your heart and um, the tissue gets destroyed, your heart can't pump if there's no tissue there. Another one that we see is squeezing forces. Uh, one of the most common ones is uh, your heart has a little protective sac that runs around it. It's a very, very thin membrane that has a little bit of fluid. It's called your, it's called your pericardium. And if the fluid in, the, in your pericardium uh, gets inflamed, uh, it's a lot of times with infection it can get inflamed, uh, since it can't go out because it's encapsulated in that sac, it's going to push in and it's going to cause a squeezing sensation on your heart. And if your heart's being squeezed, it can't move as effectively, so it can't pump as effectively. So squeezing forces such as that, which that's called pericarditis, uh, that can affect uh, your heart's function. And also cell death. So if you're having a heart attack, um, which is a lack of oxygen to your heart, uh, then your cells will start dying. And if they're dying, they can't function anymore. If they can't function, your heart won't be able to move that area anymore. So you're going to end up having a problem. Uh, the other type of heart dysfunction is electrical problems. And that's when your heart can't regulate the rate because your electrical system is all out of whack for one reason or the other, whether it's too fast or too slow. Um, so those are the two areas that your heart won't be able to function properly is mechanical problems and electrical problems. So just putting all this together into one simple explanation, uh, your cardiopulmonary system, which is your cardiac system and your pulmonary system working together, uh, they must work together to maintain life. There has to be a balance between ventilation, so movement of air, and perfusion, which is uh, respiration, for the system to work properly. These are labeled as ventilation being V and perfusion being Q, so we call it a VQ match. If you have a something going on where one of these does not match each other, we call it a VQ mismatch. So that's a way to say that your um, pulmonary system is not working properly. There's some issue whether you can't ventilate the air or the air can't the gases can't exchange so that's when you get what's called a vq mismatch and then any breakdown in the system impacts that ratio so it causes a vq mismatch and that in turn will cause a possible life-threatening situation so a lot that we covered right then um, feel free to go back and review it because this is all very important stuff this is the groundwork so that we can understand everything else that happens, whether it be shock or a lot of the other medical emergencies that we see all come down to affecting the cardiopulmonary system. And that's a big thing that we're worried about because this is what's going to kill someone is the failure of the cardiopulmonary system. So have this stuff down pat. So remember shock, it's real or its other name is hypoperfusion. So if you remember perfusion is the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the cells and the removal of waste products. So that's what we want. We want good perfusion. If we don't have that, and so it's low, that's hypo, which means low, and perfusion. So hypoperfusion um, is shock and it's our breakdown in the system somewhere using your cardiopulmonary system. There's a breakdown and that can result in the death of a patient. <clears throat> so there are four different broad categories of shock. There are different subcategories of shock, but most of them can be fit into these four broad categories. So these are the master categories of shock. The first one is hypovolemic shock. So that's low and volemic is blood. So hypovolemic volemic shock is low blood. So for some reason you have low fluid somewhere, um, whether that's bleeding, that's one of the most common forms of hypovolemic shock, or some sort of dehydration, say that you um, have been vomiting and have diarrhea for a very long time and you've pushed out all the excess fluid in your body, so now you don't have enough fluid in your body to fill your blood vessels, that's a form of hypovolemic shock. 
Uh, distributive shock. Distributive shock is shock that affects your blood vessels. So one of the biggest ones that we see is anaphylactic shock fits into distributive shock because one of the um, areas that anaphylactic shock affects is it will dilate your blood vessels and distribute throughout your entire body. So your blood vessels throughout your entire body dilate and so since you um, have them dilated you can't um, move the blood as well. Blood pressure goes down significantly. You cannot perfuse your uh, uh, cells, sorry. <laughs> and so you go into hypoperfusion or shock. The next one is cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic means that your heart can't pump pr properly. We see this a lot in heart attacks. If the um, tissues in your heart are dying and it can't push out the blood because of that, that's um, in turn will make it so we can't perfuse our, our cells. So we go into shock. So that's cardiogenic shock. That's um, the problem is gonna be with the heart. Then obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is when something is obstructing you. So obstructive shock is, uh, say you have a, um, you have a blood clot inside of your lung. So uh, the blood that should normally circulate in your lung can't move because there's a clot that's stuck so nothing can get past it. Uh, that type or that will make it so that your blood can't get oxygenated anymore because it can't move uh, through your lung to pick up the oxygen. And so your cells are going to not be able to get perfused because it can't pick up the um, oxygen. And so you go into hypoperfusion. So that'd be an example of obstructive shock. Something that's actually obstructing your perfusion from happening. So when our body goes into shock, it has its backup systems to try to make things better. If you go back to our cardiopulmonary system, uh, if your um, cardiac output goes down, your body says, oh, we need to do something to bring the cardiac output back up. I'm going to increase my heart rate, which will bring my cardiac output up. If, you, um, if your minute volume for respiratory goes down, uh, your body can say, oh, I need to breathe faster so that I can get our minute volume back up. Those are your body, our mechanisms that your body can use to compensate for losses somewhere. So when your body recognizes that you're not getting perfusion anymore to, to any area of your body, it's going to say, we need to compensate for this. And it thinks that um, a lack of perfusion is the fault of either the lungs or the heart or both. So it's going to start to tell your lungs and your heart to pick up the slack and uh, get more oxygen to these cells so it can be better perfused. So in our first signs of shock, we're going to see our body compensating for this lack of perfusion. So some of the things that you might see are your increased heart rate. You're going to see increased respiratory rate. Um, and also, if you have lack of perfusion to major organs, your vital organs really, that's when your body's going to say, well, we need to flood this area with as much blood as possible. So it's going to take blood away from areas that it doesn't need it, which like your hand doesn't need blood, it doesn't need oxygen. It's nice to have, but that's not a vital function. If you lose your hand, you don't die. If you lose your kidneys, you will die. So um, blood is redirected from areas that you don't need it, mainly your extremities, and it's brought into your core. So if you don't have blood in your hands, uh, you have, um, uh, it's a measure that we're going to talk about with vital signs, it's capillary refill time. It's if you squeeze the tip of your finger, your uh, um, fingernail really, if you squeeze it, it should go white when you squeeze and you let go and it returns to normal color. That returning to normal color is going from when you squeeze, all the blood is squeezed out of your capillaries and you have so much pressure there that they can't fill it back in. When you let go, that's your capillaries refilling with blood. So um, that's a way that we can see perfusion in the fingers is you squeeze and um, see how fast your capillaries will refill. And if they don't fill in fast enough, we call that delayed capillary refill. And if your blood is being shunted towards your core, it's not in your extremities anymore, you're gonna have delayed capillary refill time. Also, if you don't have blood um, near your skin because your skin can go without blood, it's not a 
a major vital organ that your body sees. So blood going away, uh, blood is what keeps you warm. So you're going to see cool skin. Blood is what gives us our nice color. So if you don't have blood that give you color, it's going to turn white. So we see pale, we see cool skin. And then when blood isn't near the surface, your sweat glands release sweat. And so you start seeing really sweaty skin. So your skin goes pale, cool, and clammy. And as you can see, our last one in here is also sweating. You also have some slight mental status changes. A lot of that is anxiety that we get because your brain is going to uh, shunt blood away from some of the non-vital control centers of your brain. Um, it's going to go to more of the vital areas. And so you're going to have a little bit of mental status change because you don't have the normal blood flow to a lot of the areas that give us consciousness and make us think rationally because that's not where blood is needed to survive. Your brain would rather have the blood in the areas that control your heart rate and your breathing rather than the areas that control your consciousness. So you're going to see a little bit of mental status change. All this is your body compensating for these signs of hypoperfusion. So this is what we call compensated shock. This is the first area of shock. So compensated shock is where we really want to identify that shock is happening. Uh, once we identify it, we can start treating it, which will help the body um, get rid of whatever's causing the shock to happen. And we really want to be doing that as the body can keep up with the demand that is causing the shock. So if compensated means that we are keeping up with that demand, decompensated is your next stage. And that's where your body can't keep up with the demand anymore. So it's done everything it knows to do to try to increase blood flow, but it still hasn't fixed anything or hasn't fixed enough of whatever the problem is. So then the body starts to fail at all these compensatory measures. So some of the signs of decompensated shock are low blood pressure, hypotension. We'll get back to that in a second. Uh, an extremely high or extremely low heart rate. It can be extremely high because your body is saying, let's compensate, let's drive this up to drive our cardiac output up. But if you remember, if you go too high in your heart rate, your cardiac output actually starts to go down because your um, blood or your chambers in your heart can't refill soon enough. So you don't have enough preload to get out of the heart. So either be extremely high for that or extremely low because if your heart um, starts to be become hypoperfused as well, so not have enough oxygen, it's not going to be able to perform it, its functions anymore. So it starts to lower the heart rate because it can't um, oxygenate itself. You'll also have altered mentation or complete loss of consciousness. Uh, that's because your bl blood is being shunted away from the consciousness areas of your brain and being brought to the more vital brainstem functions. You'll have pale, cool, and fully diaphoretic, which means very sweaty skin. And you'll have extremely high or low respiratory rate. Same idea with uh, what I said about the heart rate of either your body will be trying to compensate um, even more, so it'll be extremely high, or your lungs themselves don't have enough energy to keep on going because they don't have enough perfusion, so it's going to be very low. <clears throat> The true mark that we use between compensated and decompensated shock, we have two of them, is a big change in, all, in your mentation, so it's become very altered, and going from normal or high blood pressure to low blood pressure. So that change of blood pressure is really what we look for to know that we're in decompensated shock. And the reason why we are looking for that is because when your body is compensating, and telling your heart to beat faster and you to breathe faster and your blood vessels will tighten up to try to give a little bit more pressure. That means that we at least have the adequate pressure to move the blood around the body. And if you have enough pressure to move the blood around, around the body, usually you can perfuse most of the body. So that's how we know that we are adequately compensating. But if your blood pressure takes a dive, that means that you can no longer move the blood well enough to where you are not perfusing um, well anymore. So that is decompensating because your compensatory measures are not working. So that's a real mark that we use is blood pressure. And also another big mark is altered mentation because your blood pressure dives, your mental status will dive as well.
So those are two big ones. So if you don't treat shock during the compensated phase, it will go to decompensated shock. And if you don't treat shock during the decompensated stage, or if you don't treat it effectively enough, then you will go into what is called irreversible shock. Irreversible shock is when your organs start to fail, um, or the organs are failing during decompensated shock, but they fail to the point where uh, they can't recover from it. So irreversible shock will lead to death 100% of the time. Uh, some people have asked me, how do we know that you're in irreversible shock? You know when your patient dies. <laughs> if your patient dies at any point, that means at some point they went into irreversible shock. There's no real marked measurement saying that they're in irreversible shock except for their death. So once they are dead, that means that they had irreversible shock. It started at some point before they died where your body crossed the threshold of no matter what the treatment, we can't recover from this. But we aren't sure of that. We aren't sure that the body can't recover until they actually die. So irreversible shock will always lead to death. It's the last stage of shock. That's what happens if we either don't treat or don't treat well enough in the compensatory and decompensated stages. So that's why shock is very important to remember and to know the signs and symptoms and to catch early. That is huge on shock is to catch it early so that we can treat it early. Because if you treat it in the compensated um, portion, then the chances of going decompensated are um, cut down drastically and chances of it going irreversible are cut down drastically. But once you're in decompensated, irreversible is right around the corner. So you have to act very fast once you're in decompensated so that they don't go to irreversible shock. So this was a quick video um, on the transport of carbon dioxide uh, in the body. We covered most of this um, in lecture, so we actually skipped this video in class. So now we're going to move into pathophysiology of other systems. As we said during the anatomy and physiology class, really pay attention to how much time we spend on each topic in a certain lecture. And that's going to tell you how much or how important those areas are to what we need to know. So if you look back, we've just spent an hour and a half almost talking just about the cell and cardiopulmonary system and then shock. The rest of this lecture is probably only going to take 10 to 15 minutes, if that. We're going to fly through this. So when you go back to studying, make sure that you keep that in mind. Study a lot of the heart and respiratory system. And uh, this other stuff is important to keep in the back of your head. But we're going to return to this later on in the class when we talk about these specific systems. We'll go a little bit more into depth. But for right now, really nail down your cardiopulmonary system and just have a basic grasp on the rest of this stuff. All right, so let's dive in. So we already covered this earlier in, in this class, but just a reminder, your body is about 60% water. Of that 60%, 70% of it is found in your cells, 5% is in your intervascular, so inside your blood vessels, and 25% of it is in your interstitial space. These percentages aren't very important to know the exact percentages, but do know that most of it is in your intercellular space, and then a good chunk of it is in your interstitial space, and only 5% or a very low amount is in your bloodstream. Here's just a quick picture of a representation of that. So your fluid balance, um, that's the control of fluid coming in and out of your body. It's controlled by your brain and kidneys. They regulate your thirst and the elimination of your excess fluid. And if you remember, your uh, proteins in your blood plasma is what pulls fluid into your bloodstream. We covered that earlier. And your cell membrane and capillary permeability regulate the flow in and out, which we talked about when we were talking about cells. If you have a loss of fluid for any reason, it's called dehydration, which the, broad, or the simple definition is a decrease in your total water volume. Uh, that can be caused by several factors. That can be caused by a bleed somewhere, or it can be caused by uh, excessive sweating. It can be caused by vomiting or diarrhea because you have a lot of water in your vomit and your diarrhea. So you have repeated episodes, you will become dehydrated very fast. Uh, another 
uh, disruption of your fluid balance can come from poor fluid distribution. And that's water that stays in your body, it's just not where it should be. Uh, if you ever have seen, you know, 70 year old unhealthy lady at the fair, uh, walking around with ankles that are two feet wide, uh, all that um, width is actually composed of fluid that's sitting in your ankles. And we'll discuss that a lot with respiratory and cardiovascular um, stuff later on in the class. But that fluid um, is sitting in your, her interstitial space in her ankles, and that's not where it should be. So that's the example of poor fluid distribution is having water in a place where it shouldn't be. And we call that swelling. A swelling is where you have water fluid where it sh usually shouldn't be. And the medical name term for swelling is edema. And you see on the slide it says edema is too much water in some parts of the body. So from here on out, when you see swelling, think edema. That's a term that is not going to go away in class. It's not going to go away in your career. So swelling, think edema. That is your term for swelling. So moving on to the nervous system. <clears throat> nervous system, um, as we discussed in AP, main organs are your brain and then spinal cord. And they have a lot of protection around them. Uh, your brain is protected by the skull and your spinal cord is protected by the spine. Both of these are completely encapsulating bones to completely protect around the uh, organs. Also inside of your uh, skull and your spine, you have a few protective layers. Uh, you have a fibrous protective layer called your, your meninges, and then you have a layer of fluid called your cerebrospinal fluid. Both of these kind of act as shock absorbers. So if you have a traumatic incident, um, these things will take some of the shock away from your actual brain and spinal cord. Even with all these protections in there, you are still subject to um, having damage from trauma or disease. So some traumas that we will see that might affect the spinal cord, they should be kind of obvious to you. You'll see them a lot in motor vehicle crashes, in falls, in diving accidents, sometimes uh, in sports, especially football. So just think anything that can cause a significant blunt force to the head or the back, and it can end up damaging your nervous system. Medically, uh, some things that can affect your nervous system. Strokes is a big one. We'll discuss that in neurology. That strokes is where you have a cutoff of the blood flow to your brain, uh, whether that's because an artery burst or because there's a clot in an artery. If there's no blood flow to that segment of the brain that the artery feeds, then you can't produce energy or ATP. And if you can't do that, your cells can't function and they start to die off. So that's medical dysfunction of the nervous system with a stroke. Uh, another one is infection. One of the biggest ones we hear is meningitis. If you remember your meninges are that protective layer on your spinal cord. And so if you have meningitis, we think back to our terminology, ITIS at the end is inflammation. So that's inflammation of your meninges, which can cause quite a bit of pain. And encephalitis, uh, that's again, itis at the end, so that means swelling. And encephalitis is swelling of your brain itself. Uh, some other things that can affect your nervous system are disease. Probably all have heard of Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS is the uh, medical term for it, uh, which affects the ability to um, transmit uh, signals to your body. And MS is multiple sclerosis. And then another one, um, medical dysfunction is low blood sugar. Low blood sugar, blood sugar is glucose. Um, that's another term for it. And if you remember, glucose is the... Um, food for every single cell. So if you don't have glucose in your system, then you don't have the ability to make ATP. If you don't have the ability to make ATP, you can't, the cell can't function. So low, low blood sugar will affect the brain very quickly because the brain takes up a lot of energy. A lot of your glucose goes up to your brain for the cells up there to function. So if you don't have the ability to make energy, they won't be able to function. So if you can't function, then you have dysfunction. And so that's why low blood sugar is a medical dysfunction of the nervous system. Moving on into the endocrine system. Endocrine system, if you remember, it kind of regulates the body and it uses hormones um, and some proteins to regulate the body. So you, 
when the glands secrete the hormones, they send chemical messages to the body to control the body functions. So some dysfunction that we'll have with our endocrine system are organ or gland problems. Uh, a lot of these are present at birth, but some can be a result of illness. A great example is diabetes. Diabetes is the um, inability of the pancreas to produce enough insulin. Uh, and remember, insulin is what's needed for glucose to actually enter cells. Uh, so diabetes, which we'll talk about a lot in our endocrine lecture, but diabetes, you have type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is present at birth. Your pancreas at birth cannot form enough insulin. Type 2 is usually we see in um, older people and usually overweight people because they've um, eaten so many um, sugars and have so much glucose in their body for so long that their pancreas kind of just gets overworked and gives up on producing enough insulin. It can't either can't keep up with the, the demand or it's gotten worn out from producing so much for so long. So that's a um, result of an illness, and um, both both diabetic problems have similar features to them, but they are caused by different causes. So that's one example of where it can be present at birth or a result of an illness. Um, so di diabetes is a result of not enough hormones, not enough insulin, but you also have times when your glands are producing too much of a hormone. Uh, for example, Graves' disease, which we'll discuss in our endocrine lecture, that's when you have your thyroid is producing too much of its hormone, and so you end up having um, issues with your heart rate and temperature regulation. Usually you have people who actually have um, a very high temperature because your thyroid helps regulate the temperature in your body. So when your digestive system is not functioning right, it can impact your hydration levels and nutrient tra transfer. It affects your hydration levels because that's typically how we get all the fluid in our body is through your digestive system. So GI or gastrointestinal bleeding, that's bleeding somewhere in your digestive tract. Uh, you have two type, major types of bleeding. Um, you either have slow or massive. Uh, slow bleeding can be chronic. It can last for days, weeks, months, even years. Uh, hemorrhoids would be an example of that where uh, you have rectal bleeding. That's just a slow bleed. Um, every time you go to the bathroom, there'll be a little bit of blood that comes out. Um, so that's an example of a slow bleed. And then there can be massive bleeds uh, that uh, use are a result of a burst artery somewhere in your digestive system. And you're going to start seeing people either vomiting blood or having bowel movements that are full of blood. We'll discuss that a lot in our um, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal emergencies. Um, there was one call that I went on very early on in my career. It was, I was a couple months into it, and it was someone who had a uh, artery burst in her esophagus. It's called esophageal varicy. And by the time that we got there, which was only like 10 minutes from when it happened, she was already dead up. Most of the blood in her body was outside of her body at that point. It looked like a crime scene, just bright red blood splattered against the walls, the bed, the floor. It was probably on the ceiling. If I, if I looked, it'd probably be up there. So and when it's when your GI system has a fast bleed, it becomes a medical emergency very quickly. And one of the hardest things about a GI bleed is we can't just reach in there and put gauze on the bleed like we do if you cut your arm. You know, we can't get in there and put pressure on it to stop the bleed. So it ends up free flowing blood for quite some time and it flows a pretty good amount of blood because there's a ton of vasculature that wraps around your digestive tract because that's where we need to get our nutrient absorption into our bloodstream. So that is a big medical emergency. We're going to talk about that a lot more when we talk about abdominal emergencies. 
So some common um, digestive dysfunction is vomiting and diarrhea. That's your most common disorders that you're going to have. Can be caused by a lot of things. Um, a lot of people call us for very simple episodes of this. You'd be surprised how many people call 911 because they vomited once and they won't go to the hospital because they vomited once. So it's something that we do deal with quite a bit. But if it's something that lasts for a while, you do have to watch out for um, either malnutrition or dehydration. Uh, malnutrition, if they're eating and every single time they eat, they vomit immediately, then they can't get nutrition in from food. So if this lasts for days or weeks even, then they are not going to be able to um, keep up on their nutritional demands and they're going to be pretty darn sick. Uh, same with um, hydration. If you're vomiting or have diarrhea, even for one day, if you have multiple episodes, you expel a lot of fluid. And so your body is going to be dehydrated because all the fluid that should be in your cells and interstitial space has now gone into your bloodstream, then gone to be um, vomited or, uh, or come out in diarrhea. So some things are very common that are usually fine, but we have to keep an eye on them because they can turn dangerous. Perhaps the biggest issue we run into with our immune system is when it overreacts to something. So that's what's called hypersensitivity. Remember, hyper means above and then sensitivity. So it's above the normal sensitivity that you should have. Uh, allergic reactions can be to different foods. It can be to different drugs. It can be to other substances like pollen or dog fur. It can be a whole host of things that cause an allergic reaction. And an allergic reaction at its baseline is an exaggerated immune response. It's your immune system saying, this is a invader, we need to take care of it. But instead of having the normal response, it wants 500 times the response because it thinks it's a much bigger invader than it really is. So the problem with having an exaggerated response like that is all the things that your body does to kill an invader, you then have way too much production of it, and then it's going to start to affect you um, because all, you have all these free-flowing chemicals in your body that are meant to destroy things, so they're going to start turning on you and causing some ill effects. So some of these effects is it will produce edema. Remember, edema is swelling. If you think of someone who has allergies, they're oftentimes swollen up. Um, and then because we have the edema, that means that our fluid has shifted to our interstitial space. And oftentimes that fluid is coming from your vasculature. So if you move fluid from your blood vessels to the interstitial space to help fight off the invader, uh, then you're going to have a drop in um, blood pressure because of a drop of fluid that's actually in your blood muscles. Uh, this can become very life-threatening and also edema can happen um, inside the airway as well. That's the big thing we see with uh, life-threatening anaphylactic reactions is the fluid will go into your bronchioles and swell them up and so you won't be able to breathe because your airway is so constricted that you can't get air in and out because you have too much edema in there. And we're going to discuss that a whole lot more. We have a whole day dedicated to allergies. So we'll get into that a lot more later on. So some review, uh, pathophysiology allows us to understand how negative forces impact the normal function of the body. Pathophysiology helps us understand how common disorders can cause changes in the body. And remember, if you know what is happening inside the body, then we know what signs and symptoms we're looking for, and then we know how to treat it. So keep all that in mind. One example would be, if you remember back to uh, distributive shock. Distributive shock is the shock that opens up all the blood vessels. 
uh, it's what we see in allergic reactions is distributive shock. So we know that um, in the pathophysiology uh, that your blood vessels have dilated, um, and that's what's causing all these problems is your blood vessels are dilating because you have, um, and we'll get into the cause a little bit more with allergies, but you have a, what's called a histamine release. Um, you can attack it with two different types of ways. Uh, unfortunately, ENTs can't give these, but um, you give what are called antihistamines. You've probably heard that before. Benadryl is an antihistamine. That's what people take for their allergies. So you fight off the histamine that was released with Benadryl or an antihistamine. So you take away one of the causes. And then as an ENT, you can actually do this. You give a drug called epinephrine, if you've ever heard of an EpiPen. And one of the biggest effects of epinephrine is it constricts your blood vessels. So if you know that you are in shock because your blood vessels are dilated, we know that we need to get epi to constrict those blood vessels, and that's going to fix a lot of our problems. So that's an example of pathophysiology in use, is being able to recognize what type of shock is going on, know the disease process of it, and know what we'll, what we'll see as signs and symptoms, and then what we can do about it and understand why we're doing what we're doing. So, as I just said, understanding how the body compensates for um, invaders sheds lights on the signs and symptoms we may see during assessment. And understanding what compensation looks like will help us rapidly identify potentially life-threatening problems. Again, you want to catch shock while you're compensating for it. A lot easier to treat shock during the compensatory phases. Remember that cellular, cellular metabolism requires a constant supply of oxygen and glucose. Absence of either component disrupts normal metabolism. And your cardiopulmonary system combines the functions of the respiratory and cardiovascular systems to provide oxygen at the cellular level. Keep in mind that shock occurs when the cardiopulmonary system fails and cells become hypoperfused. And the body is composed primarily of water, about 60%. And this fluid is distributed throughout the body systems. And you want to keep a nice equilibrium uh, to where all this fluid is kept. All right, so some questions that we want to think about. Uh, this question is the same one that we saw in anatomy and physiology. When evaluating a patient with a cardiac problem, consider the impact on the respiratory system. When evaluating a patient with a respiratory problem, consider the impact on the cardiovascular system. What impacts do problems in these systems have on each other? So this goes back to really what we've been drilling into you for the past two chapters is these two systems work hand in hand. If you have a break in the chain link between any of these, it's going to make the entire system fail. So if you can't get enough oxygen in, you won't be able to deliver it to the cells properly. If you can't move the blood properly, then you won't be able to distribute oxygen to the cells. These things work hand in hand and can't survive without each other. Shock must be recognized immediately. What is the pathophysiology of shock? So at its baseline, pathophysiology of shock is not enough oxygen getting to the cells and not enough waste products being carried away from the cells. So that at the baseline is what is happening at a cellular level. Is you do not have enough perfusion to the cells. That's why hypoperfusion, low perfusion, and shock are interchangeable terms. You are treating a patient who was recently released from the intensive care unit with a massive infection, what's called is called sepsis. This has impaired the patient's ability to regulate the size of their blood vessels. So if you remember, if you cannot regulate the size of your blood vessels, that can that will be shock. And what type of shock is that? That's distributive shock. Remember, distributive is the blood vessels, which the blood vessels are distributed throughout the entire body. So if you have an inability to keep your blood vessels open, that's distributive shock. So knowing this, how might this affect the patient's ability to compensate for any additional illnesses? What steps should you take to help this patient compensate? So if you have dilated blood vessels because you're in shock, 
and you have any other additional illnesses, it's really hard for your body to fight off these illnesses because if your blood vessels are dilated, you don't have enough blood pressure to adequately move the blood well. So we need to find ways to raise that blood pressure. Uh, one of the biggest ones is adding fluids. So having a patient um, take fluids orally or a paramedic will give fluids through a vein. And then keeping them warm so you don't have heat loss. Uh, giving them some oxygen to help keep your oxygen levels up. And then uh, transport to the hospital where they can get further medications such as antibiotics to uh, help treat the infection that's causing this. And uh, also at times you might give something called a vasopressor, which um, again, EMTs can't do, but you might see someone else do it, especially a paramedic, which vasopressors will help close and constrict the arteries and other blood vessels so that their blood pressure will go up and you can move blood more effectively. So that brings us to the end of this chapter. We covered a lot of ground. Um, hopefully some of this stuff is starting to piece together for you because these are the foundational blocks that we're going to branch everything else that we do off of. Now, most other things that we talk about are going to return to some concept that we discussed in anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology. So these are, this is a start of really starting to understand the body and what the rest of this course is going to be based off of. So make sure you got this stuff down pat. And I do promise the class gets better after section one. Um, we're going to start to dive into some more um, hands-on stuff and dive into more um, things that you actually see in the field. So it does get more interesting. It does get a little bit better. Um, thank you for bearing through the bulk of section one. Uh, next chapter is chapter eight, which is lifespan development. It's a nice short and sweet chapter. And then we get to dive into section two, which is all about airway management. So stay tuned for some more, more interesting and intriguing stuff. But we do have to have this stuff down pat in order to understand the rest of this class.